This is indeed a nation blessed of God. Coming to you through the kind courtesy of the people of Rhema Ministries of No. 1 Sommel Avenue in Barataria. I'm particularly pleased that you have found the time in this time of revelry, in this time of behavior that are not becoming, you have found time in the midst of all this carousing to tune in to listen to this program, which I believe has become your favorite radio program, A Nation Blessed of God. And I believe that rightly so, because if we are to become a nation blessed of God, we must understand that each of us has a vital role to play. So again, welcome to our program. And if you may, you may call as many people as you possibly can. Let them know that the nation blessed of God is on the air right now. For the next half an hour, we are going to share some very important, vital issues. Because I believe that you are as filled with enthusiasm as I am, that this nation of ours, which we all love, will begin to experience what we are talking about, the blessings of God. Last week, we ended on, let me just say this before I go any further. Bear in mind what we are doing on this program. Since we began this program in the month of January, last month, right, that is, we have been emphasizing the fact that if we are to become a nation blessed of God, if we are to get the victory, it's important that we know the enemy. And so I've been spending time for the past weeks showing us what and who the enemy really is. And we have been talking about the fact that while there are so many acts of violence and People have been really disturbed and few confused and wondering if there is any way out. We have shown from scripture that the enemy, the devil, who is behind every evil, who is behind every wrong, who is behind every disturbance, he has been dealt with by Jesus Christ and he has been conquered. He has been destroyed. Jesus, who has never told a lie, and who testified to the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the Bible declares that the word of the Lord is truth, and the word of the Lord is right. So under no circumstance must we entertain the thought that what Jesus said might have been a miscarriage of the truth. It's the real truth. I said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's the truth that we know that will set us free. And Jesus is on record saying that he has destroyed the power of the enemy, and all power is now given unto him. We saw where Paul declared in the book of Colossians chapter 2 that Jesus on Calvary, he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. And on the cross, he triumphed over them all. And that's why Jesus could have declared triumphantly, Hail, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. That is true. Beloved, that will never change. The devil has been defeated once and for all. But you said to me, Pastor Anthony, if that is true, how come that the devil is still roaming up and down the place, doing all type of evil? Well, it is because He has not been confined to where he belonged as yet. The Bible declares the final episode shall be when he is bound by the angels and cast into a lake of fire where he will be there forever and ever. But until now, he is roaming the earth. The Bible declares in the book of Colossians that he is a spirit that worketh that worketh in the children of disobedience. So the devil hasn't gone to bed. He hasn't gone into hell as yet. 
he is still roaming. But the people of God need to know that he has no power. We saw last week where the Lord spoke in the book of Luke's gospel chapter 19 and he made a declaration that he gave unto us power above all the power of the enemy. And we saw whereby that word power, although mentioned twice in the same verse, each of the time it comes from a different Greek word. The first power, all power, is exousia. All exousia, that means delegated authority, is given unto me, he said, and you have that exousia above all the dunamis of the devil. The devil has not got exousia. The Bible declares in the book of, of Hebrews chapter 2 that the Lord delivered those. He destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and delivered those. So those of us who give our life to Jesus, and if you found, beloved, that you have been overcome by weaknesses in your flesh, you want to do the right and you can't do it, and you are angry at yourself, you are mad, you make resolution after resolution, and nothing seems to be working, and the things you hate, only you and God know the tears that you shed when you take off those lights in the night and you lie down with yourself and you reminisce of the life you are living. Only God knows how you long and you wonder and you believe and you wonder why can I, can't I change? That's why so many people commit suicide. Because they don't like what they see in their own life. They don't like what they're involved in. And they feel that there is no way out. But the good news is, you need to inform yourself by reading the word of God that Jesus has destroyed him. And the Bible declares in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and again in Philippians chapter 2, and again in Colossians chapter 2, all these scriptures, that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he exalted him at his own right hand and gave him a name that's above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow. Have you seen that, beloved? At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. And according to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, the last few verses there, it says that after God exalted him and put him above all name, that is name, not only in this world, but in the world to come, and has given him dominion and power and exaltation. In other words, where God has placed Jesus, no one can touch him. No power can overcome him. The contest is over. The war is over. And we said, God gave him to the church. So the church is very important, very vital. And last week I ended on answering a question, why did God give Jesus to the church? And we saw, we discussed two points last week, and one of them, because why? The church is his body. And God is making it quite clear that he functions on the earth only through a human body. We saw in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 and 7, that when God sent Jesus into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou what is not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. You see, beloved, for God to function on the earth, he must do so through a human body. That's important. So when God raised Jesus from the dead, call him back into heaven. God was not bodiless upon the face of the earth. God, with his wisdom, knew he needed a human body. So what did God do? Every person who is born again by the Holy Spirit, God now baptizes them into a unit called the body of Christ. You find then 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 13. 
You find also in Romans chapter 12. And the Bible said quite clearly, Now then, you are the body of Christ. Secondly, we saw where why did God give him to the church? Number one, because the church is his body. So he can continue to function upon the face of the earth. Number two, the church is the embodiment of Christ. And Paul made it quite clear there again in Ephesians chapter 1 that the church is filled with the fullness of Christ. All that Christ is, he has deposited it in the church. He overcame the evil one. And because he is in the church, the church is the instrument that God uses to overcome the works of the evil one. Beloved, we need to understand that. I could take a whole year expounding that. But I just give you a little touch here and there so you could understand because all we have on this program is half an hour. And I thought that the little nuggets I share, you're going to do some more research in the scriptures I give you and use the proper concordance to compare other scriptures that shed light on what we are saying. So today, tonight, I will go on now to the third point. Why the church? Because the church is God's instrument of operation on the earth. I want to repeat that. The church is God's instrument of operation on earth. And I want us to understand that, beloved. God does not function on the earth through a government or through legalism, or through education. Now, don't you misunderstand me. I'm not saying that education is not of God. I'm not saying that governments are not of God. I'm not saying that legislation is not of God. I'm not saying that law and order is not of God. No, what I'm saying, when God wants his work done on the earth, he does not turn to the lawyers. He does not turn to the government. He does not turn to the education system. He turns to the church. He gives the church instruction and the church must do the things of God. He said, as he got the body in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will. Jesus could not have functioned on the earth without being in a human body. The why we're told the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Now the church declares, Paul declares rather, in the church, he told Timothy. Now listen to the scripture very carefully. In the first book of Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul is saying to Timothy, I intend to come to you soon, but while I tarry, I have written to you that you will know how to behave yourself in the church of the living God. I tell you, when I, when I read that, something happens to me. Until I come, he says, I have sent you instruction that you will know how to behave yourself in the church, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. My God, look at that. First Timothy 3 and verse 15, the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. That's why the church must stand resolute upholding the principles of God, upholding the principles of righteousness, holiness, godliness, equity, integrity, decency, morality. It does not matter what the seats of learning declare if the proclamations and the philo philosophies and the theories of the universities are counter to the word of God, we reject them. It does not matter what learning, what scholarship a person has, if what he declares is contrary to the word of God, we reject them. We do not allow ourselves to be, to be moved and to be ruled and to be controlled by the philosophies and the psychology of men who try to boast about their learning and their seat of education. The church 
is the pillar and the ground of truth. The church must be resolute and firm in its principles of godliness and uprightness. The church must never ever concern itself with political correctness. May God help us who belong to a church, the body of Christ, when we refuse to speak out because in the mind of the people in the world, it is not politically correct. So we refuse to say that homosexuality is wrong, it's abomination. We refuse to say that when two men live together, they are wrong. The wrath of God will come upon them. And any government, any country who endorses and encourages and legislates in order to give credence to all this damnable behavior, the judgment of God will come upon the church. We refuse to speak out, compromise, because we have governmental favor. We have governmental slap on the shoulder. And we say, well, now, you know, let the politicians see about that, you know, and refuse to say what is right, refuse to call sin, sin. And to call good, good. And the Bible said in the book of, Egypt, of Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That call darkness light and light darkness. Woe unto them who call the righteous to lose their righteousness. Because of gain. And the Bible quite clear. That, beloved, we don't compromise. We don't look for a tap on the shoulder. And many of us, and I want to appeal to my brethren who are preachers, for God's sake, you are doing yourself and your church and the nation an injustice when you refuse to call wrong, wrong, because the government might be what you declare to be your government. You may be having favors from the government and you're afraid to call wrong wrong when to do something wrong you keep your mouth shut because you can't afford to lose the pocket that gave you the slap on your shoulder and the favor that you get and you turn a blind eye to homosexuality you turn a blind eye to lesbianism you turn a blind eye to all type of practices. And we come to a place. I could never forget how incensed I became in the last election in our country, general election. A candidate from Princess Town area, a wonderful young lady. She is on the field campaigning. And she made a statement. I want you all to vote for me because I'm a real woman. And she was actually made to apologize for calling herself a real woman. That is the nonsense that goes on in this country. Wonderful young woman. Call herself a real woman. And she was made to apologize for calling herself a real woman. That is the nonsense. That goes on in this country. And we need to put our foot down. And may God help the church. If we compromise. And refuse to call sin sin. And call wrong wrong. And call evil evil. The church. Is the pillar. And the ground. Of truth. And we can become so busy. Trying to be politically correct the pretend when we are asked to make us to me well you know I don't want to interfere in their politics every single day you are living politics every time you go in the grocery you are talking about politics you send your kids to school it's politics you cannot you could only get away from politics when you get yourself into heaven 
But while you're upon the face of the earth, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, and may God help you to open your mouth and call wrong, wrong, and call sin, sin, whether it's the PNM or the UNC or whatever C we have. Wrong is wrong. Sin is sin. And your first allegiance come to Jesus Christ, not to a political party. Your first allegiance come to Jesus Christ, not a government. Your first allegiance come to Christ because you, as a member of the body of Christ, have been called to become the instrument for the operation of God through the Spirit. Now, in the Bible, we have so many examples of men and women of God who refuse to keep their mouth shut when they were confronted by the wrong and the evil and godlessness. Let me give you some examples. Samuel, for example, had no problem telling Saul when Saul had disobeyed God, when God had told him to destroy the enemy and take nothing. And Saul chose the best of the sheep and so on. And God said to Samuel, go and confront him. Go and tell him. And Saul, Samuel had no problem to tell Saul to obey. It's better than to sacrifice to hearken better than the fat of rams because you have disobeyed God because you have rejected God this very day the kingdom is taken from you he was not afraid not that he hated Saul but he believed that God came first and he had no problem rebuking the king what he had done Elijah had no problem to tell King Ahab, you are the man who is troubling Israel. All the evil that we have in the country, Ahab, you are the cause. You are the cause and God will judge you. He told him that, Elijah, you can read that in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 18. Nathan had no problem telling David, David, you are the man. When David take Bathsheba's to a wife and got her pregnant and things like that. He went and he told David a parable and he became so incensed. I mean, David became so incensed and thought that a man who can do such wickedness should be killed. And Nathan said, David, you are the man. Now, Nathan, Elijah, and Samuel were not talking to men with whom they lie on the block. They were talking to the king, man, the king. They were not being rude. They were talking and saying, you have done wrong. Come back and repent of your sin. Isaiah had no problem to tell Hezekiah, set your house in order because you're going to die. You will surely die and don't live. Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 1. John the Baptist, he told the king Herod, you are wrong. You have your brother Philip's wife and you are wrong. What you have done displeases God. It cost him his head. But you are not afraid to tell the king that you are wrong. You have done wrong. Having your brother's wife is wrong. Jesus Christ himself was afraid to tell Nicodemus, you must be born again. A man who was the ruler of the Jews. He was not going to accommodate peaceful coexistence. He had to tell the man, you need to be saved. You have, yes, you have religion. You are in a position of authority. But you need to be saved. Don't argue. Don't marvel. You must be born again. Because I, Jesus, tell you that. Then we have the Apostle Paul and the rulers telling the people of the day, we rather obey God than men. We rather obey God. You are a man, but God is God, and God has the first choice. Then for last of all, 
The Bible tells us, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. James 20 verse 1. Beloved, we must be able to speak the word of God without compromise where wrong is, where evil is, and where godlessness is. We must open our mouth and talk to the people. Let them know they could be the prime minister, they could be the president, they could be a senator, they could be a parliamentarian, they could be a man with a great name, a woman with a great name. It does not matter. We must stand up against them when their behavior is a contradiction of the word of God and God expect that of you if you are born again and God expect that of me it's only when we do that that we can see this nation becoming truly a nation blessed of God beloved if you have not really gotten the victory over being ashamed to speak about Jesus, I pray God will ask God to forgive you and ask him for boldness. You hate no one. You grudge no one. But you are speaking the, the, the truth in love. This is not being rude nor being disrespectful. It's simply speaking the truth in love. Because if you love this country, it's only the truth that people get to know and practice that will set them free. I believe that this has touched many people tonight. And I want you to know you can call this number right now. The number to call is 674-1194. 674-1194. The church office will be closed tomorrow and Tuesday. So you can call this number anytime today, tonight, tomorrow, Tuesday, and we will get the message and we'll contact you right away. 674-1194. My name is Elmo Anthony, asking you that you be very careful on the road tomorrow because remember, there are people who will lose every sense of discretion and you need to be productively taking care of yourself. Have a wonderful night's sleep and a successful day tomorrow. And may God bless you and cause everything you put your hand to to prosper and to bring you good success.